Hello everyone, my name is Melissa Code and welcome to this special webinar hosted by The Mandarin. We're discussing today the results of our frank and fearless reader survey for the public sector. Before we kick off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land from which we are all respectively broadcasting from. Uh, land was never ceded, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. So on to our frank and fearless reader survey. In the last month, The Mandarin has published three stories with many more to come, sharing some of the key takeaways from our service. We'll be publishing more information about the full results in the next few weeks, but to give you a quick breakdown of our independent national survey, more than 1,800 responses to our questionnaire were received between September 4 and October 3 this year. Of our respondents, 74.2% work in public service for the federal government, it's 55.7%. For state and territory government, 41%, and for local government, 3.3%. So a nice, a nice group there to get a genuine sense of what people who work for government and in the public sector are thinking and feeling about their work and the direction of their work. Today, I'm joined by the University of Canberra's Associate Professor Russell Ayres, who has many years of public service experience under his belt. Welcome, Russell. And I'm also joined by Indeed Australia's Director of Enterprise and Government, Ryan Montgomery. Welcome, Ryan. So, Russell, let's start with you. What do you think of the survey? And maybe also give us a bit, bit of an introduction about some of the work and thinking that you've been doing relating to the findings of the survey. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Um, well, first of all, I really applaud the Mandarin doing the survey. Um, I'm a believer in letting a thousand flowers bloom and having different ways of looking at, at issues and that's what this survey definitely does. I also congratulate you on the response rate. Um, you've succeeded in getting more than 10 times the response rate in a survey we conducted. Um, so it's, uh, it's clearly uh, uh, had, a, had a, an impact in terms of the response rate. Um, I think uh, sort of when I step back and look at the survey, um, what I see is uh, a sense of, at least in terms of the respondents, people who are very interested and engaged in their work, um, very strong levels of commitment and interest in what you might call the intangibles of the ethics and the morality and the behaviours, as well as concerns about, you know, salary and lower down Maslow's hierarchy of needs type issues. So it's interesting to think about that uh, in terms of people's motivation. Um, you mentioned work that I've been doing um, together with my uh, friends and colleagues, Trish Mercer and Wendy Jarvie, have been researching uh, the agency exercised by public servants. Essentially, our, our line of argument is that in a large complex polity like ours, uh, the public service has inevitably a level of agency, a level of choice, a level of discretion. And given that, we need to better understand what the nature of that professional agency, and I emphasise professional, what the nature of the professional agency is. Um, and so what the survey does is give a sense of what, what are the motivators, um, what gives people a sense of um, success and uh, contribution at work, but also what doesn't. Um, I think it's also really valuable that you've been able to get responses from uh, state and local government um, administrations because uh, our focus has been on the Commonwealth and there's some interesting similarities and differences in the data between those groups um, and similarly in terms of the ages of some of the respondents. Mm. Um, so I'm really looking forward to um, talking in more detail as we go through with the webinar. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, you know, you mentioned that some of the focus of your academic work at the University of Canberra um, has meditated on and, and tried to pin down um, metrics or measures for this kind of notionally more intangible stuff when it comes to mm. government workforces. Um, and we also know that at an official level, the Australian Public Service Commission and decision makers who are responsible for these types of government workforce decisions are very interested in this too and that's borne out in their work um, on things like the annual APS census. Mm. What I love about 
the way our survey sort of wraps around all that great work though is there's a bit of an open conversation that we can start just with the public about what the APS needs and what the people are really feeling. Um, so I look forward to chatting to you more about that. Ryan, I know that in your line of work, you're very interested in the job seekers perspective. Tell us what you found compelling or fascinating in the survey results from the Frank and Fearless survey uh, to that end. Yeah, thanks, and Melissa. Sorry, I was on mute. Well, everything uh, that Russ said, I, I couldn't agree more with. But <clears throat> for those who, who don't know, indeed, uh, we help people get jobs. That That's what we do as a company. So we're actually the world's largest job platform. And so what that means is we operate across 60 countries. Uh, I think monthly 350 million job seekers use our platform to connect with over 32 million jobs. And, and in Australia, 10 million Aussies use our platform every month to, to find their next job. We sometimes joke at Indeed that we feel like we're a data company rusing as a job site because we have such a like plethora of job seeker data labor market insight and what we loved about doing this survey uh, in partnership with the mandarin is looking at how we could sort of get a real sense of what the public sector is actually saying in australia but how we could actually layer that in with job seeker sentiment not only in australia but globally as well because at the end of the day we are focused on the job seeker and we want to get people jobs but there is so much more that we could be doing as employers and we can see this in the data um, one of the things I thought that was fascinating just to sort of kick it off was actually the number one driver that the, the survey came out with is that the people pretty evenly spread across like state and federal government, but the number one driver was actually the vision and the mission that they get a sense of purpose with their job. Now, I absolutely loved this. Now, we are getting into the nuts and bolts. There's a lot of positives into this survey. There's also some real opportunities and, and things that need to be done better. Let's be clear. But what I found interesting is that was the number one driver. We see consistently every single year, both in Australia and you know globally as well, the number one driver for job seekers is salary and compensation. Now, we know that it's also important. You know, We're not taking that away from this report. But I was really motivated to actually see that because it shows that our public sector and our public servants have a real sense and pride in what they're doing. And I think that is so, so encouraging. And I really look forward to talking more about this because that's a great start for me. There is yeah. so much more that we could be doing better, but we've got the data as well that could have shows some of these things. And there's also a lot of trends that came out of this report in sort of leadership, skills, careers development, and even AI that we are seeing as well from a broader sort of labor market as well. So yeah. I really congratulate the Mandarin and we were so thrilled to partner on this. And um, yeah, I appreciate you having me as well. Yeah, fantastic. And I mean, so much of what you say rings true to my sense of um, what the official articulated employee value proposition working for government is sort of speaking to that values driven, altruistic, pragmatic type employer but, but a lot of the negative sentiments or the pain points that our survey identified, I think, demonstrate the institutional or cultural barriers to realising that mission. So when people feel frustrated and like they can't fulfil that vision or that mission statement, that's where things get a bit challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so we had five core themes for the Mandarin's Frank and Fearless survey. One of them was levels of satisfaction working in the public service. Another was issues faced at work. A third was work flexibility and pay. A fourth was public sector politicisation, trust and integrity, which we'll most definitely speak to later on. And as Ryan mentioned, the use of technology or emerging technology like artificial intelligence. If I can get my handy helpers to please put up slide one, we might start with career development skills and, and soft skills. And the reason I think I'd like to hone in on this particular category is it speaks to both recruitment, attraction and retention. Mm -hmm. um, Ryan, thoughts on that? Yeah, look, absolutely. You know, we, we see consistently in our data, which again correlates pretty well with, with this, that career development, growth um, is 
typically the third biggest driver. So we see salary, flexibility, but growth is such a key driver for employers and, and job seekers. It does vary by generation. I should really um, like preface that. <clears throat> but there is, you know, consistency and trends showing that learning and advancement, that is a key driver. And, and this was pretty reflective um, in that as well. You know, things that people are looking for, obviously clear direction, leadership. And so, you know, looking at skills that leaders need to have and skills for the future, you know, communication, teamwork, critical thinking, these are all skills we need to be thinking about, even is even as sort of new technologies come into it. So, you know, transformative technologies like generative AI and, and AI, we, we know they're going to change jobs, but fundamentally, we're still seeing that soft skills are still critically important in not only development, but also for hiring and organisations as well. And mm. so if we think about skills and skills-based hiring, but also in the context of um, forward planning and workforce planning, you know, as employers and leaders in the business, if you're not thinking about your future roles and the skills that are required for these future roles, you are absolutely missing a beat. Because we know firstly from a job seeker, people want this, they want to develop, they want to grow into these particular roles. Um, but also for us to fulfill the needs of business and government, we have to be thinking about this. It's so, so critical. And we are going to see this evolve. We know this you know, AI, I dare not do any webinar without saying AI at least once or a couple of times. Um, but it was, again, you know, it's top of mind for all of us. But skills has to be part of this conversation. And I think as job seekers and employers, uh, employees, I should say, we all know this as well. As a journalist who happened to go to a technology high school uh, in the early 2000s, it strikes me as bizarre that I write every fourth article about artificial intelligence these days and and indeed across my whole career it's been about that new and emerging technology but you know in year three the extent to which I was handling technology was printing a title page in a word document and then in year 10 it was learning how to make a powerpoint and so we really come leaps and bounds at least at least in the arc of my life. Russ looking at the left hand side of, of the screen that we're sharing there with our audience where people are asked what would cause you to leave the public service there's a distinct difference between the younger employees and and the older ones what are your sort of views on on that um i'm actually seeing the question on uh, politicization oh, yeah. on on my shirt so sorry about that don't know guys why that do you is. mind flipping to the slide which reads what would cause you to leave the public service please there we Next go one. there we go <laughs> sure um so uh, I think uh, sort of picking up on what Ryan was saying, the uh, the degree to which the sort of uh, intangibles, values-based issues um, really come through in this right across, um, you know, federal, state uh, and, and the different age groups. But there's very different, uh, one of the big differences I notice uh, is the under 44s to the over 45s. Um, and uh, the difference being between particularly um, work-life balance and advancement opportunities. Um, and it would be interesting, I think you would see that difference extend even more if you were to disaggregate to, uh, to younger uh, people. And in the survey that we did about agency, we didn't look so much at individual age, but how long they'd been in the service. And we found that there was a, um, a sort of uh, curve a high mm -hmm. level of uh, sort of commitment and enthusiasm and positivity about their level of agency and influence in early career public servants and people who'd been around for a while seemed to be fairly positive too. It was the people who'd been, their service was around 10 years who seemed to be having a dip. Uh, to some degree, you could speculate that was because their careers largely coincided with the previous coalition government, but I will leave that to others to speculate about. Um, but I, I think that that, uh, that age um, point that Ryan was making is really important. And that group is that group in that sort of eight to 10 year public service where there is, a, I think, a higher risk of scepticism tipping into cynicism is, you know, a really key um, cohort 
for making the public service both a better performing organisation and a better employer to work for. So I think mm. there's some some work to be done uh, yeah. in that age group. And, of course, Russ, you know, we talk about all the time, it doesn't matter who I'm speaking to, a recruiter, someone in the public service, <clears throat> senior mandarin, we talk about that impact or, or the emerging and future impact of new technologies like artificial intelligence and what it means for how government works and how that affects the workforce all the time. But then if we look to the right-hand side of the sentiment that we've captured about identifiable skills gaps in the department, people are much more loudly saying that there's a soft skills gap. What, mm -hmm. what do you think that says, Russ? Well, I think in many ways it was always thus. Um, every survey of this type I've seen over decades, soft skills uh, are highlighted. And I recall um, some years ago when I was looking at uh, sort of management practices generally across Australia, there was a view amongst employees, public and private, that um, Australian managers typically struggle in the soft skills area, in the, in the sort of human leadership aspect. So I'm not... Um, uh, greatly surprised. I wouldn't entirely sort of hard and fast differentiate between these factors, though, mm -hmm. because, um, you know, very often the, the, the mode of uh, interaction, so um, over technologies like this and so on, uh, affects the way in which somebody's um, uh, leadership and soft skills, human um, capabilities uh, can be um, sort of shown and demonstrated and, um, you know, the technology will change that a lot and Ryan's highlighted AI. Uh, when I'm doing teaching, I say to my students, um, when I started in the public service, I saw the introduction of network computers prior to which we were using microfiche for unemployment records being flown around the country. And you draw a line to the current era and we're in on the uh, cusp of AI coming in. I can't predict what type of technological uh, environment they're going to be working in, but it's sure as egg's going to be very different to the one I'm in and was mm -hmm. in. And that shapes um, and uh, prioritises these soft skills even more um, when you're dealing with uh, interactions that are either mediated or, or um, constrained or directed by the technological possibilities of what it's yes. circumstance you're in. Yeah. And, and that also just makes me ask so many questions because if AI will have a serious impact on how people do public administration uh -huh. today and into the future, what does that say about that bar we have a policy development and implementation gap. Um, what does that say about desktop research? Um, there was, I think, in the news in Tasmania just last night, talk about a planning decision which was assisted by the mm. use of AI and how problematic that was. So even in these early days, um, the bread and butter of public administration work as it buttresses against artificial intelligence is problematic and we're only just starting. The other yep. thing I wanted to ask you and, and also Ryan about to weigh in on is um, we've got this large sentiment of people saying, look, we think soft skills is a gap in our department or agency. And then I look to the left-hand side of the screen and I think that has strong connection to things like offering of work-life balance, um, workplace flexibility, lack mm -hmm. of appreciation. Organisational culture. Or recognition, organisational culture. Um, yep. So, Russ, to what extent do you think... Uh, government departments and agencies are, are currently doing that well or not? And maybe can you speak to what recent inquiries, like, for example, the Robot at Royal Commission or even more recently the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide, say about some of those basic organisational culture things? Well, I guess those types of inquiries and particularly RoboDebt, which, which I'm most familiar, really highlight um, the level of need um, and have sort of laid out some of the sort of early indications of direction um, that needs to be taken. And in some of the other questions in this survey, I was pre pleasantly surprised by 
the reasonable level of positivity amongst the respondents about the efforts that their departments were making, not about robo-debt, which we'll talk about separately, but um, generally positive about uh, their department's efforts to um, give them development opportunities and so on. Because uh, if I think back to my career, I suspect my generation of public servants would have marked that lower down. So I think that there is a, um, a heightened consciousness and focus both on a whole of service level and at individual agency levels not universally but heightened focus on um, skilling staff up giving them the um, the kick bag to be able to do their their jobs well and so that's a, a really positive thing the challenge will be around the content of how that is delivered and constructed because um, Having uh, skills in, in public administration is only half of the jigsaw puzzle. The other half is about understanding the complexity and the nuance of the circumstances that you're working in. Because you are in an organisation which is connected to but not political, um, mm. that is um, trying to respond to the diverse needs of a community and that has um, is sort of participates in all the sort of uh, dynamics that we're aware of with things like social media and now AI. Personalized. Yeah, yeah, so that's right. So um, uh, the real test will be the degree to which people feel a level of confidence about dealing with ambiguity and uncertainty. Yeah. Um, all humans like to have certainty, but um, an awful lot of the most important work that's done in the gut in public service is precisely in that ambiguous, uncertain, you know, not sure yeah. type territory. But it yeah. is different, isn't it, to just um, being comfortable with flying by the seat of your pants? Oh, yeah, no, that's right. And one of the things I um, have said very often to my students is uh, when people think that they can just pragmatically sort of wing it because mm. they're smart and uh, capable, they are unconsciously absorbing um ideas and models and frameworks they may not be very honest with themselves about them but you can see them and in my era it was very strongly dominated by a sort of economic rationalist model for example um, and ways of seeing the way in which the world uh, operated then even by people who would not count themselves as economists we mm -hmm. absorb that worldview i'm really fascinated to see what types of worldviews and i suspect there'll be more than one start to sort of replace that dominance of that economic rationalist um, neoliberal model that was so dominant in my time. Um, this is a question I'd like to throw to both of you. We've got lots of comments um, from our audience. One of them says, if you've been in the public service eight to 10 or more years, you've seen the effect of political cycles on funding projects and the paying of people far too much money for not getting things done and cap locks, people not being held accountable. Um, so maybe let's just start first with you, Ryan. What are in in from where you sit the effects impacts to an organisation when senior management doesn't take responsibility and isn't held accountable for the blunders, the clearly connected blunders that they make? And then yeah. maybe Russell, throw to you and invite you to share maybe a personal anecdote about your time in the public service and how that lack of accountability really wore on group morale and. Um, operations of of the agency in question uh ryan yeah th that's a great question and i would say this is not limited to the public sector because we see this all the time in, in across leadership as accountability for people making decisions if we're looking at it from our level of expertise we look at it from probably the overall employer brand and the culture of businesses because we see culture you know businesses with effective culture is driving better outcomes, you know, obviously greater alignment to the mission and delivering better results, right? It's all filtering down. I think when we look like in the survey, we saw a pretty good uh, response, I thought, into people feeling confident in their direct managers. But the confidence in like leadership, that's where there was a breakdown. And again, uh, you know, even if I, I come back to these skills, right? And, mm -hmm. and maybe let's reword soft skills 
to foundational skills or something that is not suggesting they're not critically important. And particularly in, as leaders, I think that question the person's asked around accountability, absolutely. But if I think about it in the context of leadership, what do we know people want? They want clear communication. They want direction. They want critical thinking. They want teamwork. All of these things that our leaders have to be demonstrating. And so, you know, where the question was more about accountability, people getting, you know, obviously a problem, but there's a greater opportunity there. And, and this report is showing us that there's a level missing there from upper departments. And, you know, one of the, the other questions that we had was people saying, like, how effective are you in your role? And, you know, I think that level of effectiveness was actually not like it was quite evenly spread over sort of federal and, and state government, which was interesting. Um, but we know that they play such an important role to drive the direction and, and the outcomes. And so if we want to see people engaged, if we want to see people effective, people need to be held to account and we need strong leadership. And let's call it these foundational skills that I think is lacking. Maybe it's a hangover from COVID because we are seeing this across multiple businesses as well. There's a disparity in it. And we look at it as well, not only from the employers that are currently within those business, we look at it from an attraction point of view. So what is it that a job seeker is looking for in those leaders? Um, if I can indulge you with a quick story of my own, right? And this is a, an example that I, that I had. So uh, anyone who finds me on LinkedIn, this will give away who the employer was. So fair, you know, fair play to you. But a previous employer of mine, um, I got approached to, to take a, a job. And so I did all my research. I thought, oh, they look fantastic. The EVP or the employer brand on their career site looked amazing. And then I interestingly went on to Glassdoor, which is inevitably, indeed, we own Glassdoor. So go figure, we've come full circle. And it was absolutely scathing on leadership. Now, I got convinced by the manager that I was going to work for to come on, on board. And he was amazing. And I wanted to work for this guy. But as I entered into the business, it was evident to me that the leadership was inauthentic and moving in a direction that I did not believe in. And mm. so there is an opportunity for us as employers, firstly, to hold people more accountable. But as employees and managers, we need to be also the ones to set the tone because we need to manage up to drive this accountability. And it comes back to your employer brand. We all work for a brand, if you will, or whoever we're employed to, but it's our job to be, you know, driving this culture also from within. I don't think it just has to come one way as well. So. Yeah. And I, I dare say in the case of government, it's like brand and by extension purpose. Um, and, you know, your references to leadership strike me because, one of the biggest takeaways observing the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide was leadership failings within the departments and within defence hierarchy. And that astounded me because they are organisations who we think of immediately when we think of leadership. So it can be remarkable how in large workplaces, large hierarchies, some of that very essential bread and butter people management gets uh, totally lost or there's sort of negligent handling of it. Um, Russ? Yeah, um, um, in terms of sort of Ryan's story, similarly, my story I'll have to sort of de-identify, but um, <clears throat> the experience this, uh, this part of the discussion reminds me of is when I was working very intensively with the minister's office about a, a sensitive issue, um, it was about a grant, uh, grant series of grant decisions. The department had a particular policy perspective. Um, the minister in the minister's office, quite naturally and appropriately, saw things differently. They're elected, absolutely, but our job was to provide the policy advice on what was um, uh, was was best from our perspective. And I was coming under a lot of pressure from the minister's office to change the recommendation that we were putting forward, and I was resist resisting that. And I was relatively new into this role, and it became fairly heated over the email, and my job boss um, stepped in and said, uh, this isn't going well, I'm going to call a meeting. So the two ministerial officers and my boss and me met, and uh, I'm eternally grateful to my boss because I was a bit nervous about this situation. 
and he walked in and he said, we're going to fix this, but I just need to tell you uh, I support Russ 100%. He's been um, acting exactly how I would expect a senior officer in our department to operate. And that laid the tone absolutely for an outcome where the minister and the officers got the result that they wanted, but the department's integrity as a policy advisor was also retained. The minister made a decision that was different to what we recommended, but it was within that minister's um, right and responsibility to do that. Uh, as long as they listen to our advice in the in the meantime, that's all we we're asking of them. So it does make a difference um, who's in the seat at the time. But, uh, the, the the sort of accumulation of personalities is what culture is in many ways, and that's what I found in that um, particular instance. Um, before we move to the next slide, there are just some comments um, from from the floor that I'd love to share. Uh, because they were quite pertinent to the conversation we just had. Um, so, for example, there was much more training and coaching in people management in the past, but this was cut along with budgets. Since then, we've seen a growth in psychological injuries or psychosocial injuries. Maybe mm. this is more coaching of manage. Is this more coaching of managers and those going into management going to happen? Why aren't management held responsible for their people management skills? And then another comment about how useful it would be to have leadership KPIs. Um, and then another comment which says, not everyone is a people manager or are trained to be people manager. It's the same in media, trust me. Yes. Um, <laughs> great journalists do not necessarily make the best bosses. We need people managers who know how to manage people, not just advance because it's the next logical step. Um, Ryan, any thoughts on that? Uh, whoever asked that question, fantastic question because I could not agree with you more. Um, the, I think the broader question, but is the responsibility on our departments that we're working for to upskill our people, to be prepared to what our staff and our employees require. The expectation on managers now I think is huge and far beyond what has traditionally been the role as a manager. And you cannot expect people to just know how to do these things because the role of the manager now is leader, coach, um, partner, uh, could be, you know, at any point, someone like to listen to personal stories and, and whatever it could be. But there is a huge responsibility of, of the manager. And so you know, to the point of should managers, you know, just get it because of tenure? Absolutely not. But it is typically how things have been done over time. But I think it is absolutely the role of the employer to ensure that those managers are getting the support they need to be effective leaders. And I still think there's a gap in that. I think we promote people into the roles because either one, they're the best person, they've been around the, the longest, whatever the, the outcome is. But you put someone into a leadership role and give them no skills on how to actually support people, um, how to, you know, understand that we're all humans at the end of the day and we all have lives outside of work that we need to be supported on too. Um, mm. You know, the, if we even just go back to the report and we look at some of these questions around, like, what are people asking? There is a generational differences. You know, and I think that's really evident, particularly in the under 44s. You can see what they're saying is yeah. <laughs> under 44 market demands something of their employer that might have been different from other generations. Absolutely. So, you know, they require career development. You know, they want flexibility. And a lot of it might be unrealistic. I'm not saying that it's realistic, but this is the expectation. You know, we know that Gen Z is typically from our data going to have 18 jobs over six careers. Now, that could be with one in, within the one employer, I should say that. And as we sort of speculated before around the tenure within different departments and moving across um, agency as well. So that's mm -hmm. certainly an opportunity. But, you know, sort of coming full circle, as managers, we need to be given the support to be able to, you know, give our people all of these things that they're requiring. And it can't just be expected um, of, of those as well. So there's definitely opportunity for both. Yeah. Could we please... um 
shift to the next slide. And, you know, Ryan, you were mentioning the sort of generational expectation difference there. Um, we have an anonymous person in the comments say, I think it's important for us to think about soft skills as being beyond just management. It's about how all of us learn to work through problems together and collaborate to deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. Anonymous attendee, I will wager a coffee that you are a millennial because that is such <laughs> a millennial sentiment. Um, and, you know, coming full circle, we were sort of having echoes to feeling like you are effective in your role and like you can make an impact in your job in the public service. And so this was this was positive, I think, this one. How effective do you feel in your role? Kind of consistent um, feedback across age groups, across jurisdictional divide, um, but a, a good enough number who say they're neutral and then a smaller number who say they're moderately ineffective and very ineffective. And even though they're small numbers, you, you know, the goal is to get that down to zero. Um, Russ, thoughts on this slide? Yeah, this was much more positive than I was expecting. Um, the comparable um, question that uh, we asked in our survey on uh, agency was, um, you know, do you feel that you're able to have an influence on your agency's um, policies and program design and delivery? And, uh, I mean, obviously the data sets are different and all that sort of thing, but the general picture is much darker, less positive than is shown um, here. That may be a function of different data sets and different um, uh, respondents, but it may also be a function of time because our survey was uh, conducted straddling the last election. Um, and so uh, I think there were some issues there. Um, I think that uh, the, the notion of what constitutes effectiveness in, uh, in your work is really important here because of the diversity of roles and functions that um, public servants have. And so effectiveness in a, um, a policy analysis and advisory role is a bit different to effectiveness in a um, HR and um, you know, industrial relations or whatever it might be, or in program delivery. So uh, it would be interesting to unpack what constitutes for this cohort um, uh, that sense of effectiveness or to use the language that we've been using, agency, because that's what this is essentially reflecting, that people feel uh, a fairly high degree of agency. And I, I'm really, um, insofar as this data is um, reliable in these things, I'm encouraged by that um, positivity. Um, there's always the risk when people feel that, that as time goes on, as things go wrong and so on, that they become embittered. Um, that's always the risk when people are motivated by values and, uh, you know, ideals of public good and so on, which mm. many public servants are, that they will be... be um, less positive uh, over time. Mm. But as it stands at the moment, it's encouraging. Um, I would love, Ryan, your thoughts on this idea of how effective people feel in their role. Um, but I'd also love you to speak to this question or comment from an attendee where they say, I have a theory that senior leaders are better at using the current recruitment process in their favour which typically favours confident, vocal, Canberra-based, full-time English-speaking people. I mean, can I just say to this commenter, I'm Canberra-based, full-time English-speaking and confident, but I certainly don't have any, any perks in my job. And then they say, it's difficult to find senior leaders who don't fit this mould and it sets a certain picture for work areas. How big a role does recruitment play in that sort of getting more diverse people into roles and therefore maybe setting an example for the workforce where they feel empowered and they see themselves represented in senior management. Yeah, we, well, we could open up a huge can of worms here and we, we might go viral, but I think, honestly, I'm so passionate about this because diversity, equity, inclusion in the hiring process and for recruitment has to be foundational. We have to remove bias from the hiring process. Now, we look at things again from a job seeker lens. Um, how do we remove bias as a job site? 
And there's ways that we do that. We remove demographic data from how we do things. There's virtu- There's many other companies, um, you know, applicant tracking system, recruiters that are doing all of this. It is absolutely critical that we are removing bias. How we can do that, there is practical ways that we should be doing this as employers and that government need to do this. First and foremost, and obviously we, we've got a lot more... Um, rope to do this in in the public sector but you know one area that we can see that is through salary transparency is we know this will remove some of the gaps we know that this has to be foundational in our employer brand and our strategies and i would challenge any department that is you know to, to this person you know not doing that we need to do better and it is our mission that we are creating jobs for everyone and everyone has equal opportunity at employment. Um, I can't speak more passionately about this. And I think, you know, it is a fair question to say. I'm not sure I fully agree with it, but I know that it is fully important that this is critical in recruitment. Now, I want to speak for sort of the recruitment industry in in this sense. And, you know, I'm not speaking on behalf of all my, my peers in, in the space, but we know consensus, it's a priority and diversity, equity, inclusion in belonging in the recruitment yeah, process yeah. is absolutely critical. Could we please move to the next slide, helpers? So the next slide that we have focuses on um, this concept of the politicisation of the public service, which had some of the, the strongest uh, sentiment shared with us. And it, in particular, I guess the um, very pertinent Robo Debt Saga, which the Mandarin has been covering quite extensively and continues to do. In fact, just yesterday I got um, Mean Streak, the book about Robo Debt, posted to me. So I'll be looking forward to reading that. Um, Russ, what, what's your sense on the findings we have here? And in particular, the sentiment that state based public servants yeah. feel like their roles are more politicized. Is that yeah. just the nature of? I guess, more frontline service delivery work, maybe. And the closeness that ministers have to their um, bureaucrats. When I was, I've always been, a, I was always a federal public servant, but I worked a lot in Commonwealth state relations and we would meet um, sometimes in, uh, in the states, in their offices, and they were typically right next to their minister's offices. Very different to Canberra, where the minister's offices are up on the hill. So I think the physical proximity um, made that sense of the political more present in the minds and the lives and the work lives of um, the state officials that I was dealing with. Um, but even so, there's, there's that difference. But also it's just a very high uh, level of concern. And um, again, I think it's really important to sort of try and unpick what this means because... Um, you know, if you look at this as a sort of public administration thing, the Australian Public Service does not have political appointees the way in which, for example, the American system has. And I, uh, in my career, I interacted with American counterparts. It's very different dealing with political appointees as opposed to um, career public servants um, in America. And so my sense of politicisation is, is attuned to that. Whereas I think what a lot of people are responding here to is a feeling that the political priorities of the government of the day are too often given a level of priority and primacy in the work of the department, in the advice that it gives and the way in which it interacts with the public and so on, than is um, sort of warranted for the role that the public service plays um, separate from being the you know, responsive to the to the um, political needs of uh, or the, the the needs of government, and so that does ring an alarm bell uh, for me, and something that I think uh, if I was a leader in the public service, I would be sitting down with my staff and saying, "How are you feeling about this? What you know, it, it, does this ring true with you? Is do you feel that um, we are being?" politicised in some way, well, how did, let's unpack that to understand what it is that's making you feel that way. There's always going to be a gap between what you might think your sort of, if your personal preference and what the system can deliver. This, that's one of the um, tensions in every public servant's life, 
the, what this tells me is that that rubber band in this dimension is getting stretched for people, and that is a worry because um, either people will start thinking, okay, the way you get ahead is by being politically attuned, um, or they become so cynical they just withdraw and go back into their boxes and just become a functionary and um, uh, try to uh, not engage as effectively as they can. Either response so, is you, really almost, What I can hear also saying there, Russell, is like there is a margin of cultural dynamic that a good public servant must have an appetite to wade into where they're prepared to respectfully and within the rules r resist yeah, well, I'd go back to the story that I said about my boss saying, you know, I'm backing Russ here. Um, uh, we were, as public servants, um, trying to be as clear as possible about our role as policy analysts, as advisors on this particular um, set of uh, grant proposals and so on, uh, whilst respectfully um, saying effectively, then it's up to... Um, political decision makers who after all are elected and we're not um, to make that decision. All we ask is to be heard. And um, and so, you know, the be one of the best ministers I worked with, who was a coalition minister, said that explicitly to me. Um, I'm here to listen, but I've got some complexities in my political life and my political world here on the Hill that once I've got your advice and information, I'll go away and test that with my colleagues and so on, and I'll come back and I'll make a decision. As a public servant, I could not ask more of a minister to um, to be able to do that. And and so that, that meant that um, I did not feel like my work as a public servant was politicised, but it was appropriately being dealt with as a, you know, the outputs that I was providing, if you like, the advice and analysis was appropriately being um, considered by that minister in the context of their political circumstances. That's how the system should work. Yeah. Sometimes that can look like politicisation because all people see is the final decision. So you do need to understand what the process is behind closed doors sometimes. Absolutely. Um, and we've got two excellent comments here, which I'd love you both to address, but let's try and confine it to the RoboDebt context because it's sort of useful I think yeah. having a, a context within which to explore these otherwise abstract ideas. So um, someone was saying that um, there's a high level of like high to moderate sentiment with respect to indicating levels of politicisation in public service work. And they ask, doesn't this fly in the face of sort of the public service value to be impartial? And, you know, Russ, you just spoke quite articulately about how there is a political dimension because as government employees, you work for the government of the day. So, you know, the reality is you have to engage on some level, depending where you sit in that pyramidal pecking order with politics. And certainly in the case of RoboDebt, there were instances where I think we can confidently say bad examples of toxic workplace behaviour, acute bullying, were sort of symptoms of hyper politicization or public servants mm. at a senior level being so um carried away with the political mandate as opposed to a commitment to steering the ship in the direction of the quote-unquote public interest mm. yeah that's right and a number of um people who commented including uh, um, Gordon de Brow, the um, Public Service Commissioner, sort of said there was a sense in which some individuals lost their sense of sort of moral direction and their sense of the clients that they were there ultimately to be serving and to be concerned about and excessive by implication, I'm not putting these words in Gordon's mouth, by implication and excessive responsiveness to ministers. And one of the things that struck me about RoboDebt was certainly sort of seeing the uh, evidence before the Royal Commission and the Royal Commission's report, the degree to which that, what you might call excessive responsiveness to the political agenda of the government of the day, um, was imbibed by people who probably had never met any of the ministers. It was really quite deep into the organisation to a degree that worried me. There were people lower down who did absolutely the opposite, and particularly people 
in regional offices and so on who push back very strongly against the um, the impl implementation and, and what robo debt implied. Uh, they, they were very honourable and great public servants. But there were also people in middle level sort of, you know, EL2, <coughs> SES Band 1, <coughs> um, sort of leadership roles, but not absolutely senior roles, who seem to have almost, you know, drunk the Kool-Aid, gone right off the deep end in terms of, well, uh, it's welfare cop on the beat. We're going to sort of keep these people in line. It's all about um, identifying even the slightest smell of an overpayment and we're going to jump on it without any recognition that there's a fairness uh, discussion to be had there and all of the sort of issues that the Royal Commission unfolded. And that really surprised and distressed me um, because I worked in that area. I was actually in the Department of Social Services when RoboDebt was being designed, not in the area that designed it. And so I knew the culture and I knew the people and I knew that there were people who were very technically skilled and committed to the purpose of the welfare system, you know, for uh, people in need in Australia. And I felt that that particular worldview was to some degree sort of sidelined and, and pushed mm -hmm. aside, um, I think because of particular leaders, but also because people made some assumptions about what what was really wanted, what was going to be rewarded organisationally. And so, you know, sometimes people talk about um, shadow values. You know, there's the explicit values that we talk about and then there's the shadow values. I think some people were responding to the shadow value of just give the minister what you think the minister wants, even if the minister hasn't actually explicitly asked for it, you know, and I, I that, that was re really concerning. Um, yeah. That's why I think the lesson of robo-debt, one of the concerns I have about robo-debt is that the parts of the public service that don't do payment systems think, oh, well, it's a payment system issue, not my problem. It yeah. is your problem because it's a cultural thing that every public servant is going to face sooner or later. Yes. I'm actually getting a bit emotional listening to you say that because I'm just thinking about my hours-long conversations with Colleen Taylor and how she felt as a compliance yeah. officer at Centrelink. She, she championed and embodied all the public service values that we talk about in a way that's kind of remarkable but yeah. was gaslit because of it. Um, yeah. for doing the right thing and believing in, in the right purposes. And that is that sense of defeat and disempowerment is just devastating for me, especially when it defines you as a vocational public servant. Um, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously care a lot about this stuff. Um, I'd just like to share a few comments which gently challenge some of the things you shared, Russ. Um where was it? Russ, I've been in the public service for 20 years and experienced this relationship and positive interaction previously in government with Minister of the Day, but have noticed a change over the last eight to 10 years in particular. The willingness of the government to listen to alternative views and information has decreased. Thoughts? Yeah, look, um, I, I would, I would uh, you know, with caveats, agree with that that perception. Each individual is going to have their own pathway through a big, complex system. So each of us has our own story that we bring. And broadly, uh, I would agree with that perception. But there are individual exceptions that sort of swing in one direction or another. Um, uh, I mentioned the coalition minister who was um, very explicit about the difference between policy advice from the public service and political decision making. But similarly, uh, on both sides of uh, the political divide, I worked for ministers who, who um, had absolutely no sense that um, there was any perspective other than the political on any given policy issue. And that was a really tough um, circumstance to work in. Um, and I do think that there is a question to be asked about uh, what in the literature is called the authorising environment. So the the culture that um, ministers and senior public servants create that um, directions uh, directs the sort of authority for how people are to work and operate. And ministers collectively and individually carry a huge responsibility for that. And I think that our political process does not prepare them well for how 
um, complex and difficult that task will be. Um, and so you tend to be reliant on the individual capacities and sensitivity and um, intellect, if you like, of an individual minister rather than the system generating what you might call the ideal minister. And I, I think that that is the, the, the risk that we have, that our political ethos generates this um, sort of tendency for ministers to see things as only political and that being such a dominant work view that um, everything else gets pushed aside, including good sound policy advice from their public servants. Um, and we've got a few minutes left on the clock and I might try and find a way for Ryan to be able to respond to these comments, but we've had a few comments come in sort of alluding to the way that we can, from a systems perspective, uh, shift the approach of senior public servants is this question of their tenure. So someone says, in my view, one of the strongest aspects to counter politicization in the APS and to encourage frank and fearless advice is to ensure that senior leaders have ongoing jobs. In some jurisdiction, the focus is on non-going SES as a potential problem. Of course, we also then need to ensure that performance management occurs at all levels, not just the more junior people. Um, and then someone else says, as a leader, I can tell you that the proximity to the end of your five-year contract influences how you handle those who decide whether you get another contract. It's human nature. So this question of job security being something that tempers or influences or contextualises your conduct as a public servant. Um, Ryan? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I think it's probably human nature. Um for all of us, you know, not only at the end of a, you know, five-year period across the public sector, but, but anyone in, in the job market as well. You know, again, coming back to some of our data, and this is global research, is job security is a huge factor for not only what we're looking, you know, for us looking for our next job, but also in performance as well. That the, the, the point that person made around performance enablement or performance reviews at all levels I think is something that has to be addressed more. You know, we, we don't see that enough um, in leadership and it's it's something that people need to be held more accountable to. And, and Russ, I mean, I've heard this sort of tenure issue mm. yeah. being held up for somewhat of a <laughs> is it the sort of, is it the sort of silver bullet? Um, oh, or... no, no, it's not a silver bullet, but it's part of the potential... Um, uh, responses. Um, when <clears throat> uh, we were doing the research for our agency, we interviewed uh, a number of senior public servants, and one in particular spoke very eloquently about the importance of getting on side with the minister, really making the minister feel at ease and relaxed because ministers come from a world which is incredibly cutthroat and very aggressive and you can never trust anybody so yes, trying to sure. establish trust with a minister is very difficult and once you've got it you've got to try and keep it now there's a moral risk of that becoming the goal rather than a means to an end of being able to deliver good advice and so on and one of the um uh counterbalances to that moral risk of becoming too close to a minister too aligned with them is a sense of assurance about your uh, tenure no doubt about it. I don't, I'm not advocating we go back to sort of permanent heads, but I do think <clears throat> some sense of um, assurance along the lines of what's been recommended by Andrew Podger, for example, is worth looking at. And I would really encourage the Public Service Commissioner and others to look seriously at the issue and not simply just sort of push it aside because um, it also signals really important um, messages to the rest of the public service, not just to the individual sort of human involved. Mm. So I do think it's an important discussion. Um, hello to Howard Witten, who's joined us on the call. I've spoken and interviewed um, Howard before. He's excellent value. Howard says, if human nature is code for self-interest, that is the key mm -hmm. problem, which I think is a sort of tantalising and thought-provoking thing for us to end on. I am so sorry to everyone else who's wanted us to talk about more things like bullying and harassment, um, how adequate work health and safety laws are, sort of criminalising that um, negative impact on people within workforces. 
it just seemed like they were bigger issues that probably deserve more focused attention. Um, so we haven't homed in on them in, in this particular conversation, but I promise you the Mandarin will be writing more about it. We'll be using the results of this survey as a springboard for um, more exploration and, and driving the conversation in directions that you public servants want us to. This is just the start. Um, we definitely do intend to evolve our frank and fearless survey and try and find richer ways to build a picture about what it is our public service needs, thinks and is feeling. Thank you so, so much, Ryan and Russ, for joining us today. Um, it's been a lovely chat. As always, never enough time. Um, and if there is any feedback that any of our attendees have, you'll be receiving an email from the Mandarin very shortly. Um, and we will also be sharing with you a full recording of our webinar today. Thank you, Ryan and Russell, for dialing in. Until next time. Thanks a lot. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye.